You be seated. It's good to be back again tonight. Thankful we have this opportunity again now to serve the Lord. And after keeping you so long last night, I feel it would be fair to keep you long again tonight. Just back there listening to an associate brother of ours in the Lord had just come from Indiana, stirred by a strange dream. He's never been in Shreveport before in his life. But he dreamed the other night that he come to Shreveport not by his car. And he come with, uh, or come somewhere to a church where I was speaking. He said, after I'd preached and prayed for the people, said something's going to happen. He said he was back the next day. And he said he knew the building, how it looked. said there's a, there's a civic auditorium across the street. But they never went in the auditorium. It says on this side in a stone building, it had a wing to it. And the building sat just like this. And the, the boy is a dreamer. I've seen his dreams and know that they're true. And he said, um, and he said then on the last night that I was speaking and praying for the sick. And I said, Something's fixing to happen. It's like a clap of thunder. It said people get screaming. And it said as the thunder began to go away, it said it made a voice and began speaking. It says that speaking was going on, that through these lattices, windows up here, come the glory of God moving in in the form of the pillar of fire. He's never seen it. He's heard us talk about it, but he's never seen himself and said, there it was, come through the windows up like that and form that light, like you see in a picture right above the audience here. And said, it was rumbling off something and said, I stood and said, that is Jehovah God. And said, he was reminded of when thinking about it, when Moses called, brought the people out of Egypt and they said, let Moses speak and not God, lest we die. And said, everybody was laying on the floor their hands up screaming. Said he was screaming too. Lord God, I love you. I love you. And his wife shook him and woke him up. See him going down the aisle right now. Brother Jackson, a former Methodist preacher. And um, he was so disturbed till he come down and said when he walked in, he was so astounded. Just exactly the way he had saw it in a dream. I don't know what it means. The Lord's kept it from me. But something could happen. Seeing Brother Jackson dream that, knowing him as an honest, real, real man, servant of God. And I, I know of him dreaming dreams. Coming to me, and the Lord gave me the interpretation. It'd be just perfectly like it. Even to one time, I go into Arizona. He had the dream of it. And he's very much disturbed. He's with his wife. He brought her. She's to be mother right away. And the only way he could go would buy airplane. He didn't have a penny to come, and somebody gave him the money. And so... It's kind of worked out mysteriously, so something could happen. We hope so. We don't know just what the Lord will provide for us. Now, we are grateful to the Lord to be living in the day that we're living in. Just before the coming of Jesus, as I've said before, it's the greatest time of all history. I'd rather be living right now than any time uh, to, on earth. I see here in front of us again tonight is my good friend, Brother Dow. I mentioned him in the auditorium this morning. Brother Dow is 93 years old today. How blessed it is. He contributes his long life to the glory and praise of God. 93 today. Happy birthday to you, my brother. And I know out of down around the country where they're listening in tonight, they also wish Brother Bill Dow a happy birthday. And a very personal friend, old Roberts. Many he's helped so many in the gospel way and everything. He's a great friend of ours. Glad to see Brother Mann here. Another Methodist preacher saved and baptized with the Holy Ghost and in the name of Jesus Christ. Sitting here, he's also one of our associates from Indiana. And I understand... Brother Hickerson sitting here by him, one of our deacons from uh, Jeffersonville, Indiana. They're listening in up there tonight. And I understand that Brother um, Wheeler, one of the other deacons, are here somewhere. And uh, I um, haven't located him just yet. Somebody pointing their fingers over. And 
I'll catch him after a bit. I'm sitting over, way over to the right. Yes. Brother Banks Woods, if you're listening in tonight, your brother was here last night. I seen him as the one out. Brother Lyle, Jehovah Witness. The whole group was converted. Lyle was brought in because of vision of the Lord. Lyle was sitting in the boat there that day when the day before was told him that something was going to happen concerning a resurrection of life. He was a real Jehovah Witness, too. <laughs> but that morning, sitting there fishing, and he caught, well, he had a great big old, that Kentucky fashion, you know, a big hook, and a little bit of fish swallowed it, and he just pulled gills, entrails, and all out, throwed it out on the water, a little bitty sunfish, and he said, a little fellow, you shot your last wad, a little flipping along on the water, died, and the wind blowed him up into some pond lilies. And the day before setting, I said, the Holy Spirit tells me that there will be a resurrection of some little creature. Perhaps there will be a, a kitten when I get back home, because just but when we was trying to dig some fish bait, Brother Woods and I was listening in the night. My little girl, which is a young woman sitting here engaged to this lanky soldier, I said, she come up, she said, Daddy, her and another little girl said, we... Uh, anybody can have any kind of pet they want, but I sure don't like a cat. So she, or no Branham. So we, she said, oh, we found a poor old cat out here, Daddy. It's, um, it, it's eat something and it's, uh, somebody's poisoned it. It's all swelled up. Said, Daddy, it's going to die right away. Can we get a little box and keep it a couple of days? And I said, let me see the cat. Well, they went and got the cat. I seen what was going to happen, so... We give her a box, and next morning there's about seven or eight kittens there, you know. So uh, my little boy, Joe, picked one of them up and squeezed it and dropped it on the f- ground, and just a just little fellow there wiggling around and around killed it. And I said to Brother Lyle, his brother, I said, you know, it may be that it be that little kitten raised up like we have seen the Lord do things. Brother Lyle just knew in the way. The Holy Spirit just told him, he was married and what he had done and the evils he had done, the things he had done. When he thought Brother Banks was telling me them things, but when it really brought him right out and told him what he'd done the night before, that was, that was too much for him. He couldn't get it. Then, the next morning while we fished all night with little fish, we was catching some for bait. But he just threw that little fish in the water, quivered, flowed over about a half hour later. We were sitting there and I, was, I said, Brother Lyle, you let the fish swallow the hook all the way down in his stomach, see? I said, take the fly line here, flip it over the bait out like that. As soon as he touched it, I said, then just hold him and then bring him in. I said, you don't pull him out like that. Don't swallow it. You catch the fish. He said, well, he had a great big old line hanging over. He this is the way we do it like that. So just about that time, I heard something coming off the top of the mountain up there, a whirlwind whirling around and around. Here it come down like that, and the Spirit of God come over the boat. It said, stand up on your feet. It said, speak to that dead fish. It said, I'll give you back your life. And that little fish been laying there for a half hour with his entrails in its mouth and its gills. I said, little fishy, Jesus Christ gives you back your life. Live in the name of Jesus Christ. Flipped over on his back and down through the water he went as hard as he could go. Amen. Brother Lyle, are you here somewhere? I, I seen you last night. What is inside, outside, or where is that? Raise your hand if I can see. What's that? In the bow. Oh, yes, way up in the balcony through the windows back there. That's the man, a Jehovah Witness. He said, Brother Branham, he's all excited. He said, uh, it's, uh, it's good to be here, isn't it? He said, uh, uh, do, you, do, you, uh, do you think that meant me? That, 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 that I call that little fish said you'd shot your last wad. said, that, that, that meant something for me. I said, no, no. Just a confirmation. <laughs> you get all upset about it. Well, we travel along and you see those things happening, knowing. I just think, what was it to show? I had a many little spastic child on my prayer list praying for it. But when the vision come, it was for a little old fish about so long, about two inches long, three. Looked like the hook as big as a fish. But what it was, was to show you that God looks on the little things too. One day when lepers were laying all over the country, he used his power and put a curse on a tree. It began to wither. 
when there was people laying everywhere needing that healing power. But you see, he wanted to show he's God over everything. Whether it's small, whether it's big, whatever it is, he's still God over all things, all the creation. So we love him because that God gives us to know if he's interested to speak the word of life into a little insignificant fish laying there dead on the water for a half hour. He can certainly someday speak life to his children. No matter if your body be no more than a spoonful of dust, he'll speak and we'll answer him someday. He's God who's interested in everything, all that we do, all that we say, everything he's interested in. Now let us bow our heads everywhere. I wonder now before we pray if there's anybody tonight that's interested in him. But yet you haven't got your reservations yet for the other land where we're going to see him. You know, you can't come in without reservations. And you haven't made them yet, but you would like to be remembered in prayer now that everything will be made right between you and God tonight. Would you just raise up your hand and just say, remember me, Lord. You're, just let him see your hand. God grant it. Heavenly Father, as we stand tonight between the living and the dead, and these things that's happening in these days, mysterious, sure they're mysterious, but God, you know whether they're true or not. You are the solemn judge of the heavens and earth. And we say this, Lord, just to encourage the people some of the things that thou hast showed us that they might be encouraged to love you and believe you, serve you, and to know that no matter how little the deed is, good or bad, you see it. I pray, dear God, that you'll bless every one of those hands tonight. And the soul and spirit that motivated that hand to go up, I pray, God, that this will be the night that their reservations will be made for that land beyond the river. Granted, heal the sick and the afflicted, Lord, both here, all out across the land where the, the, the broadcast to the phones are coming in. Bless those out there that's unsaved all the way from California to New York, from Canada to Mexico. Grant, Lord, that every person under the sound of our voice tonight will be saved from their sins, healed of their sickness because of your divine presence. And this, our brother Jackson, who's flown all the way down this thousand miles here to be here because something strangely stirred his heart. And they shall dream dreams and see visions Dear God, thou hast kept it a secret for me what this means. I don't know. But if you shall visit us, Lord, prepare our hearts now for that visit. We might be under expectations, not knowing what you will do and not knowing if you have promised to visit us by this dream. We do not know. But we are just quoting those things that we do understand that you promised to visit your people, and we pray that you'll make yourself real to us here. In the name of Jesus Christ, we ask it. Amen. <clears throat> now, tonight, after keeping you so long, last night and this morning, and I kind of getting a little bit hoarse, Got a little piece of hair I got I wear over my bald spot here when I'm preaching, but I forgot it this time. And this air sweeping through these windows is beginning to give me a, a little bit of hoarseness. I uh, used to, I'd have to close meetings, but since I got that, then I don't bother with it no more, just go on. And uh, I forgot it. And it's, um, I kind of can feel it. So your prayers will be appreciated. And now, 
These are two services each day that they are uh, kind of get, uh, you know, when you got a lot of miles, <laughs> that uh, you can tell it. So now to you people in California uh, and out in Arizona, we all send greetings across the nation. Brother Leo and the group that's waiting on the Lord up at Prescott are invited now and all you people around Phoenix a week from tonight, we are to be over in Yuma at the uh, banquet. It done sold out all the tickets over there and got a bigger auditorium and it can't place the people, so come early, you all, to, to get in. And we're going on into Los Angeles from there next Monday, next Sunday, Sunday night. And so we're looking to see you all over there. God's rich blessings rest on you all. To you in New York and you that are round up in Ohio and different places, soon I want to preach the message of the trail of the serpent, the beast at the beginning and the beast at the end at the tabernacle. Billy will send you a note for that when we're going to speak it because I do that in the tabernacle because it'll at least be four hours or more long. So now, uh, so... I want you here, here and wherever you are now to turn to the book of Job. Very strange book to preach from. But I want to just use a few notes here now. And then tomorrow morning here at the tabernacle, there will be Sunday school services. At uh, We start here at what time? 930. 9.30. And then I have the privilege of speaking here again tomorrow. And the Lord willing, I want to speak on the subject, if he's willing now, by studying this afternoon, to show you that there's only one place that God will meet a worshiper. Mm. Only, and, and can tell you what that place is and what the name of that place is, where God will meet the worshiper. And then tomorrow night, I'm going to ask the favor. That is for a healing service. And I I want an old-fashioned healing service. And if the Lord willing, I want to speak on a subject that alarmed me today when Brother Moore and I were talking out together, my precious brother, and we were discussing scriptures and how lovely it was to be with them, brothers, like old times. And he said, you know, Brother Bram, all the preaching you ever done for sure in Shreveport, the lamb and the dove was one of the most outstanding messages you ever brought us here at Shreveport. Said, I guess with your message so strenuous to you today, you never get to one like that. When I miss that, I miss my message. <laughs> Love is my dear dying lamb. Thy precious blood shall never lose its power. For all the ransomed church of God be saved to sin no more. Ever since by faith I saw that stream, thy flowing wounds supplied, redeeming love has been my theme, and shall be till I die. Tomorrow night, if it be the will of the Lord, I want to preach on a subject on, on the wings of a snow white dove. Tomorrow night, the Lord coming down on the wings of a dove. That is, if the Lord willing, my voice don't get too bad. Now, so pray for us. And then I want an old-fashioned prayer meeting like we had at the beginning. No discernment. Just simply give everybody a card that wants to be prayed for. Now, you must have a card. So be here early so Billy can give you a card and keep it lined up. If you don't do that, people just keep doubling back and doubling back and doubling back and you go into the line. Anybody can have a card. I want Brother Jack Stand by me at the prayer line like you used to. Brother Brown to bring the people to me instead of Billy Paul. <laughs> I, 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 want, I want an old-fashioned prayer line, and we'll just pray the way we used to years ago. I'm glad tonight to have another uh, associate brother with us. Just looked around and recognized then and seen him a few minutes ago, Brother Gordon Lindsay. He's one of the old-timers who was with us a long time ago. Doing a great job printing. He's printing my book now, the, uh, the Seven Church Ages. We hope to have it ready again, the Seven Seals. 
If he happens to read that before he prints it, we're going to have a theological discussion. I can just feel it coming. <laughs> but he knows I'm no theologian. So. Um, well, we're looking forward to tomorrow night. If you're in, Brother Lindsay, be here tomorrow night. If you are, drop around and be with us on the platform for an old-fashioned prayer meeting. How many would like to see one of them old-timers again? Or we bring the people up, that'd be fine. I bring out your sick and afflicted tomorrow night for that purpose, then. Now, if you've got the book of Job, the 42nd verse, or 42nd chapter, and the first six verses of the 42nd chapter of Job, very strange. Brother Ted Dudley, if you're listening in tonight over in Phoenix, you remember you and I talking one time about a week or two ago and we referred to this? I told you someday that would become a text to me and I want to use it tonight. Then answered, then Job answered the Lord and said, listen close to this reading now. I know that thou can do everything and that no doubt can be withholden from thee. Who is he that hideth counsel without knowledge? Therefore have I uttered that I understood not things too wonderful for me, which I knew not. Here I beseech thee, and I will speak. I will demand of thee, and declare thou unto me. I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now mine eye seeth thee. Wherefore I arbor myself, and repent in dust and ashes. Now, I want to take a text from that fifth verse. I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye seeth thee. May the Lord bless his word. Job, let's take a little of his life. Job was a prophet. He was a man that lived back before the Bible was written. It's been thought that Job was one of the oldest books of the Bible because it was written before Genesis was written. Job, this great warrior and prophet, was a, a mighty man in his day. No doubt that he had been brought up and had served the Lord all of his life. And it lived such a gallant life to the people. All had respects for him, but he'd come to a place to where he calls it here being tempted of the Lord. But I'd like to use the word being tested by the Lord. And truly, every son that cometh to God must first be tested, tried, child trained. And then... If the testing gets hard and we think it's too hard and won't listen, take heed, then he said we become an illegitimate child and not a child of God because there's nothing can move a real born-again child of God away from his parents. He's part of him. You can no more deny it. You can deny yourself. You've had the experience. You've been trained and tested and now, this man, being a prophet, he had had access to God's grace. But Job didn't have a Bible to read. He, uh, the Bible wasn't wrote then. But he had access to God by revelation and by vision. That's before the Bible was written. Now, we find out, and take some of his life, when God blessed him, he made him a great man. Why, well, even everybody respected him, even to his wisdom, had become so great his inspiration from God had vindicated him to be God's servant so plainly until the people come from everywhere to hear him. And then Satan began to accuse that man. And that's the way he does ever inspired servant of God, Satan is always there to accuse him of everything that he does that's not right. 
And now we find out uh, his life and trials and his great faith. Even Jesus, when he came on the earth, he uh, referred to the patience of Job. He said, have you not read of the patience of Job? Faith waits with patience for the promise word to be fulfilled. Now we notice here that Job, after he went through his trials, all of his afflictions, he had a lovely family, they were taken from him. He had good health, it was taken from him. Everything that he owned in this life was taken and he sat on an ash heap with a piece of crock scraping his boils. And even to his own wife, spoke against him. She said, uh, why not curse God and die? He said, thou speakest like a foolish woman. He said, the Lord gave and the Lord taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Now, Satan had come up before God, because he could come before God and accuse the Christians or the believers all the time. So he accused Job of many things. And said it Job the reason he could serve God because everything was coming good for him. But said, if you'll just let me have him in my hands, I'll make him curse you to your face. I want you to notice that the confidence that God had in a believer. See? He's, in other words, God said to Job, or said to Satan like this, you can't do it. He's a just man, justified. He is a good man. He is not one like him in the whole earth. Oh, what a man. That God himself would say to his enemy, My servant is so perfect, there's not another man on earth like him. Oh, if we could only be that kind of a man. God could bestow that confidence upon us. That no, that will not twist from his word or his being anyway. Stay exactly. And he can put his trust in us. Now, Job was a man that carried out God's commandments to the letter. Exactly. And Satan knew that. But he said, if you just let me have him, I'll make him curse you to your face. So God told him, he said, now he's in your hands, but don't you take his life. And Satan even stretched as far as he could on that. He took every friend and everything he had, almost his complete life. But he couldn't take his life. But Job still held right on. There was no turning back. You see, when a man or a person has once really come in contact with God, with that genuine revealed faith that God is... There's nothing, no time, nowhere can ever separate that man from his God. Amen. I believe as Paul said, there's no strife, no hunger, no peril, neither living creatures or death or anything that can separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. You are securely anchored in him because you were ordained to that life. But Satan thought he could twist him around a little bit and cuff him up and make him do it. But you see, Job, with his perfect revelation of God and who God was and how God loved him, he waited, no matter what the circumstances was, he waited for his faith to be confirmed. Because it had a grip on God, a revelation that I spoke of last night. Now when the sick people... It's in the building. The crippled people. Or you that have a need of God. When you can get that type of a revelation. That you are justified. When you are actually justified. In asking the thing that you're asking for. And believe that he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek after him. There's nothing can ever separate you from that faith that's anchored to you. Amen. See? But first it has to be revealed to you. Amen. Someone come not long ago, a group of men, some of them listening in tonight, and told me, said, I kept telling them, go to Kentucky. Oral's down there. I knew it was. I seen it in a vision. Well, Brother Demas and them didn't go for a long time. After a while, finally they said after Texas had moved in, 
And they said, uh, now we're going down. I said, you ought to have went a long time ago. But they didn't do it. Demas said, I made a great mistake in that. We're not doing that, Brother Branham. I said, if you'd have went down there, you'd have had it all. Well, they wouldn't listen to it. Then, the first, then before we left that night, the, the place where we're having lunch, the Holy Spirit showed me a great uh, crack in the earth. And in that was full of oil. And these overflows in Kentucky were just little beds of oil that they were pumping from. But this one come from the main stream. And I said, Brother Demas, it's there. So they went to searching for it. said, go down and tell us where the, where, where the oil well is. I said, oh, no. No, no. See, we don't use a gift of God for commercial. Amen. No, no. He could tell me where it was at, but I don't have any need of it. I wouldn't have faith enough to ask him. See, if I had a need of it, I believe if I'd ask him, he'd tell me. But first, you see, your motives and objectives has to be right. You have to have reasons for this. God don't give you those things just because you ask, and you cannot ask in faith unless there's a real objective to that, to be in the will of God. See, if you want to be well, what do you want to be well for? If you want to be healed, what's the reason you want to be healed? What are you telling God? What do you want to do with your life when you get healed? There's got to be, you've got to have a motive and objective, and they have to be right according to the will of God. And that's when the faith is revealed to you, and God, by sovereign grace, places that faith in there, then it's over. Now, see, now to make that word true... When the brethren got down there, they got one fellow went over and bought a bunch of stuff and sold leases and cheated the other one in this way. I said, you see, it won't work. Now just to make the prophecy sure, within a hundred yards of where these men were digging their well, some man struck the big gusher. And it's there, 1,100 barrels of oil in a half a day or something like that, still putting it out, right in that main stream. But just to make the prophecy, the word that had been said that it was there, it was there. The rest of them nearly is all dried up everywhere through Kentucky. Little ponds, they pump them a little while. They go, it's on the overflow from this. See? But because of the selfishness got among it, the objectives was wrong. Signing up a bunch of stuff that would be this way when they promised they would do it for the kingdom of God. But it looked like it's for themselves. See? And it won't work. No selfish thing will work. Your motives and objectives has to be exactly perfectly right. Then you have faith that if our hearts condemn us not, then we have confidence. Amen. See, we've got to have confidence. I want this to the honor and glory of God. Then faith has a, a channel to move into. Amen. If it doesn't, then you've got mental, intellectual faith and not genuine faith from God. Amen. That intellectual faith will get you nowhere. Might get you emotional, but it won't get you the healing that you're looking for. So Job, checking himself with the genuine faith that God had given to him, that he was just, that he had done everything that God required him to do. Now, when we're going to be prayed for, for our sickness, I wonder if we have done everything that God requires us to do. Have we followed every iota of the Scripture? Have we given him our hearts and lives to service? What's the reason you want to be healed? That's the reason you can't get faith enough. See? Because you haven't maybe made this thing to God sincerely from your heart. Like Hezekiah did. Give God the reason. He wanted to set his kingdom in order. And God sent his prophet back and told him that he'd be healed. See? But you have to have those things made right first. So then... As soon as you get to these places and know that it's been revealed to you by the Word of God, by the revelation, by the Word that God requires you to do, then you have faith, genuine faith. Now, just like Abraham, when he was uh, 90 and 9 years old, uh, read Genesis 17, God appeared to this old man now, 90 and 9 years old, when he was almost 100 years old, that had been waiting upon that promise all these years, he appeared to him in the name of El Shaddai, the breasted one. And what an encouragement it was, yet the promise wasn't fulfilled then, but Abraham, I am the Almighty God. El Shaddai, 
the strength giver, the breast of God. Like I've told you before, like the little baby that's fretting and sick and crying, and it lays upon its mother's breast and nurses its strength back from her. Because it's satisfied while it's a nursing. Because the only access it has and knows of is a mother's breast. It knows no dose of medicine. You might give him a dose of medicine, he'd squeal and cry. Give him a shot in the arm and he'd carry on. But the only access to satisfy him is a mother's breast. And he said, Abraham, you're old. Your strength is gone. Your arms are withered up. Your manhood's gone. But I am your mother. Just take a hold of my promise. And be satisfied while you're waiting. Be rested. Now that's why every believer, no matter how bad the cancer's got you, how long you've been sitting in a wheelchair, any of those things, just if you can grasp that revelation from God, then be satisfied knowing that it's going to happen because faith waits patiently for the promise. Job knew that he was right. When we find out here in the Scriptures that there was these fellows come to him, his church members, everything that once seemed dear to him had turned against him and tried to accuse him of being a secret sinner because all these things that happened to him. You hear people yet today say, I told you, look at him. You see, why? Well, that ain't altogether the truth. Sometimes it's God testing his people. In this case, it was God testing Job, the best man there was on earth at the time. Now, he was holding him there because it, he knew Job was a prophet that had a vision from God that he had exactly done what God told him to do and he, God was duty bound to keep his promise to him. Oh, all Christians has got to be that. When the last struggle of our life comes and death rattles are in our throat, we still must hold steady and remember that God said, I'll raise you up again at the last day. Amen. Amen. Got to hold that. That our testimony, our place in Christ, our position, what we are, knowing that we have kept every word of his commandment. Blessed are they that do His commandments that they might have the right to enter in. See? And when we know that no matter what anyone has said, we've kept every commandment that we see in the Bible that God has done us, told us to do with reverence and love and respect to the Creator who wrote the Bible. We say man wrote it. Man of old moved by the Holy Ghost wrote it. God wrote it through, man, like a prophet speaks his word. It's not the prophet's word. It's God's word. See, through the prophet. That's the reason it has to come to pass. If it's truly the truth. Now, we see this great man. And remember, Job had no Bible to read in his day. No. He only went by inspiration. He was a prophet to whom the word of the Lord comes to. He had, he had only to be inspired. Because he knowed his position that he was God's prophet. Now the only thing had to happen was for the inspiration to strike him. And then he knowed what he said would happen. Because it was by inspiration. That's what the church, if it's in order, set in order, it only, it's got the mechanics ready. It only needs then the dynamics. Amen. Tonight, if we'll get the mechanics ready. Get our hearts right, the things that we can do. Follow every word. Follow him in baptism. Follow him in every order that he told us to do. Get every mechanic ready and stand there. Then we're ready for the dynamics to be lit off. Amen. And only God can do that. And that's to drop into your heart that faith that says, I am now healed. Amen. Then don't make any difference what circumstances is. You're healed anyhow. Because it's faith. By faith, you're healed. He had a channel of communication to God that he got by inspiration. He had a way of moving himself out and letting God move in. And he knew he was justified. It was a gift. It was a gift for the people. 
Not for Job, but for the people. That's what all divine gifts are to serve God's people with. Everybody's not ordered to be a prophet. All of them is not ordered to be pray for the sick. All of them is not ordered to be pastors and so forth. But it's a channel that God has opened to them. And here's we had this morning in the lesson. That he, one man has no business deviating in the next man's channel. No matter how inspired, how much it seems, how well, how many is at the meeting this morning? Let's see your hand. See? see, you cannot. There's David just as inspired as he could be. All the people shouting and glorifying God for a reason that seemed exactly scripture. But he was a wrong person. That inspiration should have come to Nathan, not David. See? He never even consulted Nathan. You see what happened? We have... God said he does nothing until he reveals it to his servants, the prophets. Amen. And Job was this prophet in this day. Now, only thing God had done to Job was always give him wisdom and his word and inspiration. He could get no inspiration. But he knowed all of his mechanics. He had offered the burnt offering. He had done everything he knew to do was right. But he couldn't get a word from God. But the devil couldn't move him. <laughs> There you are. Now, there you are when you're prayed for. You don't have to run back through a line or go let somebody else pray for you. When you know you've done exactly what God told you to do. See? Then wait for that channel of inspiration to open up to you. Now I'm healed. When it drops in there, that's all over. Oh, you don't need no prayer lines, nothing else. It's over. It's been revealed to you. See? Just like the old prophet at the coming of the Lord Jesus. We find out it was revealed to him, the old sage, that he would not see death until he seen the Lord's Christ. And he believed that. And he waited for it. And the people thought he was crazy. The old man had lost his mind, but he still believed it. Nothing could shake him from it. He knew God had revealed it to him. For the Bible said it was revealed to him by the Holy Ghost. Some of you coming into the temple at that minute, walked over and gave praise to God and said, Let thy servant depart in peace. When he picked up the baby, mine eyes have seen thy salvation. He knew he was going to see it. No matter how many babies he visited each day, he knew God had revealed to him that he was going to see the Christ before he died. Simeon believed that. Now when it's revealed to you that you yourself has received God's promise. The inspiration, you being Christians, it struck you. You don't even need a prayer line. The thing, the only thing you need is an open heart when all the mechanics are ready and let the inspiration drop in and then nothing can change your mind. You've got it. Outside of that, it won't do no good. Now notice, Job needed a channel of inspiration. He had it open. He had a channel uh, to communicate with God by his inspiration. He had a way of moving himself out and let the word of God move in. Notice how they, how they come to consult him from the east and from the west. People looking for him because they know that what Job said was the truth. They know that man told the truth. Because what he prophesied, that's what happened. And so people come from the east and west. He said he'd go to the markets. The young princes from the east would bow before him just to hear one word of consolation from him. It's great, mighty wisdom because they know the man was honest. He didn't want to boast up himself. He had no axes to grind, no strings to pull. He's just an honest prophet before God. Amen. And they had confidence in him. Amen. And everybody come from east and west just to speak to him in a moment. He spoke of it in the Bible here. But you see, he liked inspiration to tell him what all this was about. God let it happen, didn't tell him. Amen. Then one day we find out that in that, that's the time that everybody, as long as you can help them, all right. But when they want to disagree with you, that's when trouble comes in. <laughs> but he alone knew he was right. His pulsation of faith, of hearing God. Words speak to him. He knew it was the truth. Yes, sir. He knew God's voice. Nobody could fool him on it, for he knew it. 
It, but whenever you, something's revealed to you, maybe contrary to what the people think, I'm speaking a line of prophets. Once God reveals something, which if there ever is a secret comes out from God to be made known to the people, it will never come through a seminary. It will never come through a group of people. It never did. It always will, has and will through one individual, a prophet. Amos 3, 7. See? The Lord does nothing except first he reveals it. Through his prophets. Amen. And now Job had something wrong with him. But he couldn't get the inspiration on him. And it was wearing him. And that when you get in that kind of a fix. That's when the enemy moves into every friend near you got. And they begin to accuse him. Oh it must have been a miserable thing for him. And all his friends that accused him. Satan then goes and joins himself with the enemy. That's when Satan comes in. Let me have him. And I'll make him curse you too. I'll make him deny his message. <laughs> I'll make him curse you. I'll make him go back and say it was all wrong. Then he tried him with everything he could. To all the great men and the friends that he used to have. But Job stood flat footed. For he knew he had heard God's voice. Oh, God, help tomorrow night I can get that wings of the dove. I heard the voice of God that said something. And it's going to happen that way. Just the same as these other things has happened. It's going to happen. Now, Job knew it was going to happen. And he knew that God had told him that. That he was just. But they made him a sinner. So he waited then for the inspiration. Satan getting in all the, the people and he'd come around uh, his comforters, the so-called, and accused him, but it didn't move him a bit. But when the word of God became vindicated to him, he had heard of God by the hearing of the ear, but one day setting out at his lowest point. And while he was sitting there, and everyone accused him, even his wife telling him he was wrong, He's scraping his boils. And Elihu came down and rebuked him for being selfish about the way he was accusing God and so forth. And then at that time, it was when inspiration struck him. That's when the lightning began to flash. The thunders began to roar. That's when the inspiration struck the prophet. And he raised up and he said, I know my Redeemer liveth. And at the last days he'll stand up on this earth. Though the skin worms destroy his body, yet in my flesh shall I see God, whom I shall see for myself. He saw he'd been talking about the trees, the botany life, how it dies and lives again. Water brings it back again. The smell of water, the scent of water, the results of water pouring upon a tree or something or seed that went in the ground. He said, but a man layeth down, he giveth up the ghost, his children come to honor him, he perceive it not. Oh, thou would hide me in the grave, Job 14, till thy wrath be passed. He said, but if a man dies, shall he live again? All the pointed times of my life, I'll wait till my change comes. Thou will call me and I'll answer. Thou will appoint me bounds that I cannot pass. So forth. He knowed all these things, he watched a tree live, but what happened to a man when he died? He didn't raise up again. So God was showing this Redeemer. He wanted to see if there was somebody who could intercede for him. He had interceded for so many people. But now, is there somebody who can speak for him? Could there somebody put his hand on Job or on a sinful man and a holy God and make bridge the way? Could he go to his house and knock at the door? Would he open the door and talk to him a while? But then, when the inspiration dropped into his heart, then he could see God. The lightnings are flashing. The thunders are roaring. And when it did, he stood up on his feet and he said, I know my Redeemer liveth. My Redeemer in the last days he'll stand on the earth. See, he had begun to see God's reaction to his faith. Now, we wonder if we could see God. Is there a way that we could see him? Now, it was the only way God had tried Job out. He said, I have heard of thee with the hearing of the ear, but now I see thee. 
But now I see thee with my eyes. The vision of the invisible had been made plain. He seen the cloud rolling around. He heard the flashing of the lightning or saw it and seen the rolling of the thunder maybe on a clear day. And he seen God was in that cloud and in that lightning. He could see God with his natural eye. See, because the invisible was made visible. The visible vision of others was then vindicated clear to the natural eye. Just like faith with works as we spoke on last night. Abraham no had no Bible to read either, but he was a prophet. His vision and his faith, and it seemed wrong to others that he should think that way, that he should think there's going to have a baby, but they did have the baby because his vision of the baby was what he was talking about. I'm going to have it. I'm going to have it. But when the baby was born, then the other people could see with the eye what he saw in the vision. And when you go to acting upon what you believe in your heart, then the people know God and know what's happening to you, but the way you act, that's how you see God with the eye. But to him, all he had done that was good, all that he had done for others, he needed somebody to intercede for him. When the birth of the baby come, Isaac, the, um, the inspiration that had led him to this had vindicated his vision to where the people could see that what he had saw in the vision was actually the truth. Now, sometimes these great pulsations of faith come right in the time of crisis. It's usually crisis that drives us into this. It was a crisis that drove Job into it. Why is that the end of his life? His children was dead, his camels and all of his goods was gone and destroyed. And his own life is broke out from the crown of his head to the soles of his feet with boils. It was a crisis that he pressed himself. There's where the inspiration struck him. Oh, men and women tonight, if you can look around and see how close we are to the coming of the Lord, you who put off the baptism of the Holy Ghost, you may be relied upon some sensation or something that you've done that Satan can impersonate. And can't have the real spirit in you to go all the way in God's promises. How can a man that claims to have the Holy Ghost deny one word of this Bible being not right? You can't do it. No matter how religious you are, how many churches you belong to, how many books your name's on, if that genuine Holy Ghost is in you, which is this word manifested, you'll see the message of the hour. Because it's the Holy Ghost that does it. But there has to be something like that off. Inspiration strike you. And if, there's, if you pour water on the ground, on the ground, on the ground, and there's no seed in there to strike it, how can it ever bring forth anything? There's nothing there to bring forth. That is that only the elected of God will see it. The elected of God seen it in Noah's time, Moses' time, Jesus' time, the apostles' time, Luther's time, Wesley's time, Pentecostal time. Because that was a seed that was on the earth when this inspiration was poured out. Now when the inspiration is poured out together, the bride together. It's only those who are elected will see it. Jesus said, I thank thee, Father, that thou hast hid these things from the eyes of the wise and prudent and reveal it to babes such as learn. Now, inspiration has to strike it. Now when the inspiration struck him, that did it. He had it then. Now we find out. It comes a time of these crises when the press is right on. And you look around today. Look at the condition we're living in. Aren't we living in a modern Sodom and Gomorrah? Amen. Hasn't the world come back? That was a Gentile world that was destroyed then by fire. Didn't Jesus say in St. Luke, the 17th chapter, the 28th, 29th, and 30th verse, that as it was in the days of Sodom, so shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man when the Son of Man is being revealed. What is a revealed is a secret made known. A revelation is to reveal or make known a secret. Now these things that's been hid all through the church ages is now being revealed, made known. Now we can say that, and if God didn't back that up, that's wrong. 
See, God don't need anybody to interpret His Word. He's His own interpreter. He said, a virgin shall conceive. And she did. He said, let there be light. And there was. And we are not living in Luther's age, Wesley age, or the Pentecostal age. The Pentecostal age is only a restoration of the gifts coming back to the church. But we're living in the evening time. We're living in the time of the calling out of the bride. Just as it was hard for the Catholics to see Luther and the Luthers to see the Wesley and the Pentecostal, the Wesleys to see the Pentecostal age, so is it hard for the Pentecostals to see this age. Amen. It's always been that way because it's poured out upon an elected seed. Hallelujah. And that only is what the Bible teaches. They can't see it. Jesus even prayed for them. said, there is blind and didn't know it. Revelations tells us in this lady of sin church age, when he was put out of the church, that they're naked, poor, miserable, blind, and don't know it. Back again, they can't see it. Can't understand it. They're so creeped up in traditions. But remember, the promised word of God by the mouth of Jesus Christ, the very God that spoke creation into existence, he was the one before the foundation of the world. That spoke the words and let there be and there was. Or he said he was in the world and the world was made by him. And the world knew him not. But as many as did know him, to them he gave the power to become the sons of God. The very creator. And the very creator himself. When he raised up Lazarus from the dead. He said, think this not strange. For the hour is coming. That when all that's in the grave will hear the voice of the son of man. And shall come out. The very God that said, let there be light, said the voice of the Son of Man would wake those that are in the grave. It has to happen in its season. He spoke, let there be male and female and so forth and all this. Years and hundreds of years before it happened. The inspiration hit the prophet Isaiah. He said, unto us a child is born, a son is given. His name shall be called Counselor, Prince of Peace, the mighty God, the everlasting Father. Years passed, months, years, days, weeks. Years rolled by, hundreds of years rolled by. 800 years later, Emmanuel was born by a virgin. Why? It's because it was spoke by the lips of God's anointed prophet. A seed went forth. See? That great hour said, Will you seek, ask me of a vision or a sign? He said, I'll give him a sign, an everlasting sign, a virgin shall conceive, an everlasting sign. Now we find that those hours of real stress, that's usually when the Spirit of God moves in. He let the Hebrew children walk right into the fiery furnace before he ever moved a hand. But when he moved, he moves. Now, we notice here that in Luke, the uh, 17th chapter and the 31st, that he said in the last days that the Son of Man would reveal himself as he did just before Sodom and Gomorrah. And the same conditions would exist. He told about Moses, or about, and I beg your pardon, not about Moses, uh, but about Noah. How that the people was eating, drinking, and so forth, married and giving in marriage. Then he come around, he said, now as it was in the days of Lot, so shall it be at the time when the Son of Man is being revealed. Now watch, the Son of Man was revealed to Abraham's group as a man, a prophet, in a form of human flesh, an ordinary man with dust on his clothes. And Abraham called him Elohim. Now Jesus promises here that in the last days, the Son of Man will be revealed again to that same type of group, the royal seed of Abraham, just before the fire falls. Remember, the church never received any more witness. Abraham and then didn't. The promised son that they were looking for was brought right away after that. And the church is looking for the promised son. He will come right after the days of this ministry. 
to be revealed from the heavens. Now, we see it too plain. It's got to be. Now, the only thing there has to be is something pulsates, gets into a man. God vindicates and tells him and shows him that that is the thing that happened and you sure go to it like Moses did. He didn't want to deliver those children, but God spoke to him in a burning bush. He didn't want to go, but he had to go. Moses had heard of him being the great Jehovah. But then he could see him. He was in the form of a pillar of fire. I've heard of thee, but now I see thee. What was he seen in? His word vindicated. God told Abraham that his people would sojourn in a strange land for 400 years. But he would bring them out with a mighty hand. And notice, this burning bush gave vindication to what the prophet Abraham had said would take place. Moses said, I've heard of it. But now I see it. Now we've heard that in the last days that the Son of Man will come among His people and reveal Himself to the people in the same way that He did at the, just before the destruction of Sodom. The Son of Man. What did He do? He knew the secrets that was in Sarah's heart. Also, give the promise to Abraham. Abraham had heard God's voice. He might have seen him in many different ways. I don't know how he talked to him through dreams or through prophecies. But this time, he saw him. I've heard of you. Now I see you. And the church has heard of God. They've read of him. And what he did. And the promises he made. But now we see him with our eyes. Just the same as Julian. I've heard of thee, but now I see thee. My, what a difference. Moses in that crisis cried out. And we find out in Exodus, the 14th chapter, the 13th and to the 16th verse, Moses in that great strain there with the children of Israel, inspiration struck him. And he said what he was supposed to say, not knowing he said it. See, stand still. And see the salvation of God. God had never spoke to him yet. See the inspiration struck him. They said why did you bring us out here? We are to have died in Egypt. Was it because there's no graves down there? Bring us out here and let us die. We could live in peace as slaves until we died. But you brought us out here. Moses a prophet. Knowing he had access to God. Was inspired. And he said stand still. And you'll see the salvation of God. For the Egyptians you're looking at today, you'll never see him again. Amen. How did he know it was going to happen? How did he know? He didn't know what he spoke. But as immediately after he spoke it, God told him how to do it. He said, Moses, don't cry to me. Take your staff in your hand and stretch it out over the sea and tell the children of Israel to walk. Amen. Amen. The inspiration. That's why it strikes you if you're sick. That's why it strikes you if you're afflicted. Something's revealed to you. And you see that's been revealed. You speak out, I'm healed. Then God tells you what to do. Rise up and start walking. Amen. Then it's all over. When you can do it that way. That's the way God does it. Then you see God manifested through yourself. It was God that told him to do it. Now, then all that was present, all of Israel that was present saw that inspiration that struck Moses, they seen God with their own eye blow that water back from one side to the other and that pillar of fire let him right across the, the sea. He heard of God, then they seen God. Joshua was in an hour of crisis when the armies was routed and the sun was going down. Joshua was a prophet and he knew that if them armies ever had a chance to unite again and come against him, he would lose more man. So in that hour of crisis, when something had to be done, there's only one thing. If he could keep them running, he'd rout them everyone down. But there wasn't enough light to do it. So Joshua stood, raised his hand and said, Sun, stand still. And moon, hang over Agilon till I get to it this battle. And the sun stood still. They heard Joshua speak and then they seen God with their own eyes in action. Hallelujah. Sure. 
See, right. of course, it was a paradox to see something that seems to be impossible, yet it's true. But the sun stood still, says the Bible. I don't know what you people think. It thinks the world's run now, but anyhow, the sun stood still. Perhaps Joshua never have tried to figure out how he was going to, to do it, how God was going to do it. The only thing that he said was, sun stand still. He said it perhaps not knowing what he was saying. Because it was God that gave it to him. And he worked. Same thing in Mark eleven twenty three. If you say to this mountain, be moved. And don't doubt in your heart, but believe that what you said will come to pass. You can have what you said. Amen. But you can't stand there fumbling in your mind and say it. You've got to be inspired to say it. Amen. 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 Excuse the expression. But that day sitting there in that woods and God's my judge and I can fall dead on this pulpit. And that scripture stumped me all my life. Sitting there that morning in the woods. And I was thinking on that. And that voice spoke to me. He said that scripture is like all scriptures is true. And I thought, well, how could it be? And he said, you're, I said, he said, speak and it will be that way. Don't doubt it. And I was talking to somebody sitting out in the woods. No squirrels been there for three days. There's no squirrels there. And I sat in a sycamore thicket. Squirrels don't even come. Anyone hunt squirrels? Well, they're not in sycamore. And I've been sitting there. Wind blowing real hard about 10 o'clock in the morning. And I was thinking again. And it said, you're hunting. And you need squirrels just the same as Abraham needed a ram. Well, I thought that's always told me the truth. But this sounds funny. And I got up from where I was sitting looked all around. Where is that person that was talking to me? Nothing. Wind is blowing real hard. And I thought, could I fell asleep and dream that? No, I wasn't asleep. I sat up against a tree there watching Supposed to pick up Brother Woods and Brother Softman back there. Just a little bit. Around 10 o'clock in the morning. Farmers all out there working, gathering their corn. I heard it again say, You are hunting and you need game. How many do you need? And I thought, now I don't want to overdo this. I'm just going to ask for three. Three squirrels. I want young three red squirrels. I want them. He said, then speak about it. And I said, I am going to get three young red squirrels. He said, which way will they come? Well, I thought I went this far. There's something talking to me here, just the same as you hear me talking. God in heaven, this Bible over my heart knows that that's true. And, he, and I said, well, I picked out a ridiculous place. An old dry limb hanging out there about 50 yards where my rifle was shot in. I said, the first one will be right there. And there he was. I rubbed my eyes and looked back. I turned my head and I thought, I don't want to shoot a vision. So I looked around again. And there sat the squirrel. I threw a shell up in my gun. I aimed up and I see his black eyed young red squirrel. I thought, I, I, maybe I'm asleep and I'll wake up in a few minutes. See, I'm dreaming about this. Well, I leveled down, shot the squirrel, and it dropped off the limb. I thought, well, I don't know. I thought, should I go over and look for it? And I walked over there, and there it laid. I picked it up, and blood ran out of it. A vision don't bleed, you know. So I picked it up, and it was a squirrel. I got real numb all over. And I looked around, and I said, God, that was you. I said, thank you for this. Now I'll go out. He said, but you said... Do you doubt what you said? You said you'd get three. Now, where will the next one come from? I thought, well, if I'm dreaming, I'm going to continue on. So I, I said, I picked out a, an old post over there of a tree that's all wrapped up with this year uh, poison ivy. You ever get a squirrel in that? So I said, the next one will come right out of that poison ivy. And there sat that young red squirrel looking right at me. I set my gun down, rubbed my eyes, and turned around again. I thought, there he sat, turned his head sideways. I shot the squirrel. And then I started to go home. But I said, you said three. Do you doubt what you said? I said, no, Lord, I don't doubt what I said. For you're confirming this is one scripture that stumped me. Not if I say, but if you say 
Not if Jesus said it, but if you say it yourself. And I thought somehow I broke into that channel. And I know he's here because I'm almost beside myself. I thought I'll make this one ridiculous sure enough. I said, there'll be a red squirrel come down off that hill, come right down this way and right by me and go out and sit on that limb and look down there at that farmer. Here he come down the hill. Went right out and sat looking at the farmer. And I shot him. Satan said to me, you know what? The woods are just full of them now. And I sat there till 12 o'clock and not another thing happened. It goes to show that when God, He's the very creator of heavens and earth. Listening in at Jeffersonville. Now, there's a family named Wright. Brother Woods and I went out to see them. They make the communion wine for the church. Little Edith was sitting there in the room, a little crippled girl. She had been sick all of her life. And so we'd always look to God to heal her. Her sister, a widow, her husband had been killed. Her name was Hattie, very humble little woman. And while Brother Banks and I went out to get her a rabbit, they cooked a big cherry cobbler and made me sit down and eat. We was all sitting around the table. We were talking about this. It just happened a few days before. And while I was sitting around the table talking about this, all at once I said, what could have happened? I said, Brother Wright, you're an old man. Honey squirrels all your life. Brother Shelby, you're an expert squirrel hunter. Brother Wood, so are you. I've hunted them since a kid. Did you ever see a squirrel in a sycamore and locust thicket? No, sir. I said, it just wasn't there. I said, the only thing I know is just the same God. When Abraham needed a ram, he was Jehovah Jireh. He could provide for himself. And I said, I believe it's the same thing. And little old Hattie sitting back there said, Brother Renham, that's nothing but the truth. She said the right thing. When she said that, the Holy Spirit dropped over into that channel again. Every one of them felt it. I raised up. I said, Sister Hattie, thus saith the Lord. You said the right word like the Ethiopian woman said. The Holy Spirit speaking to me now and said for me to give you the desire of your heart. I said, now, if I be God's servant, if it is, it'll happen. If I am God's servant, then I'm a liar and it won't happen. I'm a deceiver. I said, now try and see it's the Spirit of God. She said, Brother Random, everybody was crying. Said, what shall I ask? I said, you got a crippled sister sitting there. I had $20 in my pocket to give to her that she had put in a donation. A woman don't make a capital of $200 a year on that little old poor farm. Her and two boys. Her boys had got to be regular rickies. The school days, you know, and just sassing their mother, 15, 16 years old. And all they were standing over there laughing at what I was saying. And I said, You've got a father and mother sitting here so old. You haven't got any money. Ask for the money and see if it comes in your lap. Ask for your sister to see if she don't get up and walk. I knew then. Like Job. There's just something you know when you strike it. So I know. Here I stand before about ten people. I said, if this doesn't happen, then I'm a false prophet. I said, what shall I ask? I said, it's up to you to make your decision. I cannot make your decision. She looked around the little woman. And all at once, she said, Brother Branham, the greatest desire in my heart is the salvation of my two boys. I said, I give you your boys in the name of Jesus Christ. And them sniggered, laughing, fun-making boys fell across her mother's lap and surrendered their life to God and was filled with the Holy Ghost right there. Wow! That is truth. God has the authority to kill me before these people across the nation. Many of you here, and in Jeffersonville, I can hear the tabernacle ring out now. Amen. Because we're sitting right there listening. Because it's the truth. What is it? Yes, it's when the God, by His sovereign grace, yes, it happens. Outside of that, it won't happen. In that crucial moment, think of the man and the people that I'm acquainted with. God bypassing all the celebrities and everything to give a poor little old humble woman who can't hardly sign her own name. And He knowed that what she'd asked for. That's the greatest thing. For her sister is now dead. 
and her mother and father has to die. The money would have perished, but the souls of her boy is eternal. And that was an hour for them to catch it. And just as soon as I said, I give you your boys in the name of Jesus Christ, there they fell across their mother's lap. How many of you here knows that to be truth? Amen. Hallelujah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. Why? Inspiration. Now, I have heard of thee that thou could create squirrels. I've heard of thee that thou could create a ram. But now I see thee with mine own eye. The manifestation, the vision made visible. When God promised anything, that's what he'll do. Notice, when you have a need, perhaps like Joshua, he had a need. He never thought of the circumstances. He spoke it. And it was God. You believe the sun stood still? So do I. How did it do it? Don't try to figure it out. But it did it. Joshua did it and raised his hands. That crucial moment he had access to God. And that's what happened. It was timely. The Spirit of the living God had seen the need of it. And pushed upon Joshua to say it. The same God seen the need of Abraham. The same God seen the need of confirming this scripture to me. That that scripture is true too. The same God seen the need of those two predestinated boys. And it was that moment he proved it and confirmed his word. St. Mark 14, we see a woman believed on him. She had had need and seen he had need for his feet to be washed. She had only to be inspired to go into action. Now listen close to before we close. She only had to be inspired to go into action because she had already heard about him. She heard that he forgive a woman of her sins, a harlot, and said, which one of you is without sin cast the first stone? She had heard about him, but now she's seen him. She was inspired to serve him. That's the only thing you have to be. Let the Holy Spirit tell you that you're a sinner. Let the Holy Spirit tell you you're wrong. Let the Holy Spirit prove to you by the Scriptures that you're scripturally wrong. And what? Because it will only stir through one straight channel of every Scripture of God. It won't bypass for nothing. If you do, it will never do you any good because the Holy Spirit can inspire to you. But if the soul isn't right with God as we've been through this week, it's no good anyhow. Remember, false anointed ones will rise in the last day. Amen. Not false Jesus, it's false Christ. Anointed ones. And will deceive the very elected if it were possible. Notice, she had a service to do for him. She had heard of him. Now she's seen him with her eyes. She had a service to do. And she had nothing to do it with. So she rushed forward anyhow to do the service. God furnished the water and towels to wash his feet. She had heard of a living God all of her life. But now she's seen him with her eyes. She knew it was him. And inspiration struck her and said, this is the messenger. He needed a service. She had nothing to serve him by. His feet was dirty. But she rushed forward anyhow to do him a service because she was inspired to do it. Oh, backslidden church member, denominational man or woman. Can't you see the need Jesus has tonight? Amen. Inspiration can only strike you. This is the hour to do it. But she's seen him with her eyes. The others there were even mocking him. They didn't believe his message. Frankly, the host, the pastor host, old Simon, had got him down there to make fun out of him. They didn't believe he was a prophet. So then when it seemed like the devil had worked it just right in for him to say this, he said in himself, if this man was a prophet, he would know what kind of a woman that was at his feet. <laughs> if he was a prophet. See, it wasn't even revealed to him who he was. There couldn't be any inspiration to strike him because there's nothing there to strike to. But it was struck to her. Her eyes had seen beyond his criticism. She believed he was. See, the word 
of the prophets, she knew that that was all the words of the prophets was vindicated in him. She had heard he was on earth, but now she sees him. Watch what she done. She seen the word made flesh, the Messiah, the Emmanuel. When she gave vent to her pulsation of faith, of revelation of who he was in the time she was living, that he was God's lamb for such sinners as she was, she went forth to serve his needs without knowing how she would do it. That's where a genuine healing comes. When it's revealed to you that he was wounded for your transgressions, bruised for your iniquity, and with his stripes you were healed. When it's inspired to you to see his presence here of St. Mark 11 or St. Luke 17, 30, that he's going to reveal himself in the last days among his people in human flesh like he did before Sodom. When you see that and something strikes you, the doctor might say, the cancer's still there. The patient might say, I, 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 uh, uh, I don't know how I'm going to walk, but I'm going to walk anyhow. We don't know how it's going to do. She went forward to serve him because inspiration struck him, struck her that that was the hour, that was the messenger, that was the Messiah who was to heal. And she believed it. And he needed a service done to him and she went forward without anything showing that she could do it. She just went upon her inspiration. Watch. God broke up the fountains of the tear glands in her eyes. The same eyes that had heard, hairs that had hurt him, the eyes that seen it broke up with joy. Then that heard God given long hair with them tears flowing down. God furnished her towels with her hair and with her tears. She served his needs, the need of the living God. She had heard about, but now she's seen him. She could do him a service. Oh, sinner, why don't you do likewise? As you see the needs now, that he needs you, uh, your service. Now you see the one who once you heard about in the Bible. We seen him last night come in here and what he done. We see him meeting after meeting. And sometimes we sit just as cold and indifferent and say, yes, I know the scripture says it. Oh, I, I've seen it done. See, We have no enthusiasm. It don't seem to strike us right. There don't seem to be something like if you was uh, a pouring, uh, taking a match and striking it. If the match hasn't got the sulfur right on the head of the match, it cannot strike. And you can rake and rake and rake. But if some chemical has killed the sulfur on there, it will not strike. There will be no light. But if that chemical, the sulfur, the strike against the metal, will still on there when it strikes, it will light. And when the true genuine vindication of the scriptures of this last day message and you see the presence of Jesus Christ that you had heard what he had done in his life and hear the scriptures say he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And just before this Sodom condition is fired over with the wrath of God, see Jesus return amongst his people formed in human flesh and do the same thing he done. My Lord, spike our souls to glory in order to do something to us. Why? It's dropping on that. You heard in the Bible what he did. How the woman touched his garment. He turned around and told her what her trouble was. And her faith made her whole. Now he promised that he would do that same thing again just before the world would be burnt and the world would be in a Sodom condition. The New Testament. The prophet. The God prophet. The prophet of prophets. The God of all the prophets. The fullness of the Godhead bodily. God manifested in the flesh. The creator of Genesis. Hallelujah. It's his word. He said it would happen. And we see Sodom condition. We see the world in that condition. Now we see him come down and do exactly what he said he would do. Now we've heard of him. Now we see him. I've heard of you with my ears. Now I see you with my eyes. Amen. Amen. I see him with my own eyes. What an hour it should be. What a time it should be. The confirmation of his word. Always, when the word is confirmed, that's God speaking in his word, making himself visible that you can see. Now, here's a little old prostitute off the street. 
she falls at the altar before Jesus. And she washed his feet with, with the tears and, and wiped him with her hair. God honored. He said, wherever this gospel has been preached, let this be told for a memorial to her. Why? Look how filthy she was. But something struck. She seen the word of the promise from the Garden of Eden. This woman's seed shall bruise the serpent's head. She seen the Messiah that had been born of a virgin. She heard he was to be born of a virgin. But they heard that man was on earth. She heard there was a young rabbi prophet who healed the sick. She believed that. And here she come down the street walking around, looking around. And she looked over there and seen the great party going on. She slipped up to the fence and looked through. And there he was. There he was. Something said, that's him. That's all she needed to be inspired. See what happened? She's seen the word of God made flesh. She had heard with her ear. Now she saw with her eyes. Now everybody knows that we have a promise of the church condition in the last day. The church in its present condition can never fulfill the commandments of God. The Great Commission can never call a bride out. Which one would do it? The Pentecostals? I should say not. None of the rest of them. That's a shuck that's on the wheat. They come out and look just exactly like the wheat. But there was no wheat to it. It opens up, but the grain comes out of that. They organize. They kill themselves. There's where they die. They're stalks. But the wheat has come up through there, and now it's beginning to farm in the bride farm. The corn of wheat that fell into the ground through the dark ages. It had to die. That critic saying, why would a God of mercy could open up the Red Sea, stand let that poor Christian be eat up with lions and burnt and everything, stand up this like he laughed about it. The poor ignoramus, did he not know except a corn of wheat fall into the ground? It had to die through those dark ages like any other corn of wheat has to go beneath the earth and be buried to bring forth in the first reformation them two blades of Luther, the stalk. It had come forth in the West Sands out down there to bring forth the pile and the tassels of the great missionary age. It had it come forth in the Pentecostal for the restoration of the gifts, almost to deceive the very elect. It looks like a wheat grain. Open it up, there's no wheat there at all, it's only shuck. But back in there, then they begin to form the oneness organization, the Trinity organization, the Tunis organization, the Church of God organization, and all the organizing, just death exactly. And now what happens? But it's a shelter for the wheat. It's been growing through it all the time. Now it's beginning to pull away. The wheat's beginning to be seen. This is not a Pentecostal age. This is a latter day age. This is a bride age. This is the evening light. This is when Malachi 4 must be fulfilled to follow God's pattern. This is Luke 17, 30 to be fulfilled. This is the scriptures of Jeremiah and all the rest of them that Joel has spoke of these days. This is that day. I have heard, Lord, that it was coming, but now I see it with my eyes. No matter how many false impersonators rise, that jambers and jambers with all their gimmicks to do everything that Moses did never shuck him or Aaron at all. Amen. They know word like Job. They know who their inspiration Amen. come from. Amen. They know it was thus saith the Lord. Amen. And the same Bible spoke of them said they come in the last days impersonators. Amen. Those religious denominations when something started. Who started first? Moses or them? Amen. If they had started first, first Moses had been the, uh, the mimic. Now we got all kinds of discerners and everything else that's trying to throw your mind from the genuine thing of God, which God has proven to be the truth by His Scripture. We've heard of it with our ears. Now we see it with our eyes. Amen. You believe it? All our hearts. Inspiration. And that day, when the Son of Man is being revealed. Yes. A Son of Man, Jesus Christ, made manifest amongst His people. Amen. A man walked down there before Abraham and his group. Just an ordinary looking man. Dust on his clothes. He had his back turned to the tent. He said, where is your wife Sarah? Not S-A-R-R-A-S-A-R-A-H. A-B-R-A-H-A-M, not A-B-R-A-M. Called his name. 
So it worries you, say she's in a tent behind you. So I'm going to visit you according to the time of life. And she laughed up her sleeve. She said, why did she laugh? <laughs> now, I, he promised. Them people was the one that was looking for a promised son. Now, I don't care how much the people act in these denominations that they're looking for Christ. Their actions prove they're not. Amen. Amen. Right. Your actions speak louder than your words. Amen. All they're thinking about is making denominational members. Amen. But there's some people, one here and there, that's looking for the coming Amen. of the Lord. Hallelujah. They're Hallelujah. watching for those. Only those will He reveal Himself to. Yes. Only those will understand. Just the elected understood who He was. Just think there's about maybe three million people, Jews on earth. There wasn't one third of them ever know He was there until He's done come and gone. But he revealed himself to those who were waiting. John the Baptist and, and uh, the apostles that had been called by John and so forth. And blind Anne in the temple. Simeon, the priest that was revealed to him by the Holy Ghost that he is going to see the Christ. All those great religious leaders, theologians and things, blind as they could be. Only can the rain raise the seed if the seed's already there. And as you was a germ first in your father, and he didn't know you, yet you were in your father. But through a bedding ground of your mother, you were made manifest in his likeness, and then he could talk to you. God, the great God, if you've got eternal life, then the germ of eternal life was in God at the beginning, and you were there. You were in his thinking, your name and all. And he, by foreknowledge, ordained you to see this. And you that was not ordained will never see it. Amen. But remember, in the name of the Lord Jesus, the hour is here. Amen. Won't you believe Him? Yes. Give your lives to Him. I have to stop. It's after nine. Let's bow our heads. I have heard, Lord, of Thee. Now I see Thee. Lord Jesus, bless this people as they wait. Now I'm going to ask you a question. I'm going to let the Holy Spirit, I trust that He will, search out your minds. Try you. Try your soul and see if you really believe. And if you find there's a little bit of doubt there, Will you raise your hand and say, Lord Jesus, let me see you. I've heard of you, but I've never really seen you. Let me see you. I'll believe. All right. It's fine. Is there some here that doesn't know him as your Savior? Raise your hand and say, if I, I'm a sinner, but if, I, if, you, if you just let me see you, Lord Jesus, manifest this word that they're talking about. I know that that's how Job seen you. I know that's how Abraham saw you. I know that's how all the rest of them saw you because it was a, your promised word being vindicated. And I've heard all kinds of things and gimmicks and everything, but I understand that there's a last day message in the land that was spoken of by an angel on the river in 1933. I heard of the healing services going forth, and I know when that takes place, it can't stay in that same old denominational rut. It wasn't sent for that. never did stay there. Okay. What if Moses would come to this building ark like Noah did? Float out of Egypt, down the river. Oh no. Okay. No, he had a message from God. He was the manifestation, that prophet arising on the scene, or to prove to Israel right there they hadn't had a prophet for four hundred years. They hadn't had a prophet. And here a prophet rises on the scene. They ought to know that something's going to happen. Israel again hadn't had a prophet for hundreds of years. And here comes Jesus on the scene. And the woman at the well said, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Now we haven't had one for 400 years because he knew what was in her heart. See? Now, we promised the church age to reformers. And we've had them. But he promised in Malachi 4, he'd keep his pattern in the last days what would take place to turn the hearts of the children back to the faith of the apostolic father. For that very purpose, 
And the church is so broke up in denominations and isms. It's so tore to pieces, though. So it's dead. It's been a carrier. And then he promised in the hour of the seventh angel's message, the seven seals would be revealed and the mysteries of God would be declared. Revelations 10. When the seventh angel begins to sound, his message, not the healing service, the message that follows the healing service. Jesus is a great guy as long as he can heal the sick. But he said, when I and my father are one, uh uh-uh, that was wrong. Job was great until something happened to him. See, it's always that way. Believe. Will you accept him now? Raise your hand. Say, I do believe him. I want to accept him. God bless you. God bless you. That's fine. I'll sit real still and pray just a moment. Dear God, in this solemn moment, it's going to be a time like this when there really will be a clap of thunder someday. And the Son of God shall descend from the heavens with the shout of the voice of the archangel and the trump of God. The dead in Christ shall rise. And each one of us knows and are aware tonight, Father, that we're going to have to answer for every word we give, every word we say, even the thoughts that's in our hearts, we're going to answer for. I pray thee, God, in Jesus' name, that you'll cleanse every heart that's in here. Cleanse my heart. Cleanse the hearts of this people. And may we be prepared, Lord. And may our spiritual eyes be open tonight to see the glory of Almighty God. We have heard of Him. Oh, Father God, we pray that you'll let us see Him. Grant it, Father. Grant these blessings, I pray, through Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Remember, in your heart where you're sitting, make your little altar. Say, Lord Jesus, come into my heart now. Give me something to, something I can hold to. Let me feel that inspiration that tells me that you're present. Now, what a statement to make to people. What a, a thing to do. Now, I'm going to ask the Lord God, ask how many to take the tapes? You heard of what time is it, sirs? Did we show those magazines and things a year before it happened? Science is stumped on it. There was the Lord Jesus crowned and with that white wig on as he's seen in the Bible in Revelations 1 and Daniel. Supreme judge of heaven and earth. Right there when science can't even see it themselves. And in the observatory out there in the University of Arizona, down through Mexico, they're searching, have been for the last two years. And there it was told you it was going to happen before. How about the Alaskan earthquake? Watch Hollywood fall into the, the sea. Watch and see if it doesn't. He's never told me anything wrong yet. It'll do it. Just watch and see if we're not living in the closing hours of history. No man knows what hour he's coming. But I know one thing. I believe in my present condition, if I'm in my right mind, if I wasn't a Christian, I'd sure want to be a real Bible Christian. Not a denominational. Don't rely upon because you've shouted. We heard that this morning. Proved it by the Word of God. It's all together out of the will of God. Didn't do a thing because death. Don't be in the stall. Be in the life. Have faith in God. Do you believe that the God that made this promise, that did appear Himself in the book of Genesis and appeared to Abraham and performed that miracle, that same God was made flesh, human flesh, born of a virgin. That was a theophany there, of course. But then when He come in human flesh and was the same man and performed the same things, don't you believe that if God could get a person that He promised to do according to Malachi 4, a channel that he could speak to, he'll perform the same thing he said he'd do there. You believe that? I believe he would too. Do you believe that you could have the faith to touch his garment? His faith to touch the garment? Do you believe present now that something's speaking to your heart that would tell you that you have faith to touch his garment? You believe you could do that? You reach up and touch with your faith then. 
not with emotion, just with absolutely pure, unadulterated faith, just say, Lord, I believe. I believe with all my heart. I want you to touch me because I've heard you done it. Now I want to see it with my own eyes. And I can't touch him. It takes God to do the touching. You believe he'll do it? I'm looking right back to my left here. It seems like there's a channel kind of, as I spoke, pulling that way. Been directed it that way, now it comes in wonderful. <laughs> it's a lady sitting there with her husband. She's not from here. She's from Texas. Dallas. She's suffering. Also her husband's suffering. She's suffering from a complication. She's had an operation. That's right. Her husband suffers something with his back. Back trouble. Mr. and Mr. Carver, Texas. Dallas, Texas. That's so raise up your hand. I'm a stranger to you. Is that right? No way in the world for me to know that. What is it? I have heard of thee by the ear. Now I see thee. See what I mean? Now, ask that couple. I've never seen them in my life. I have heard of thee with the ear. Now, I see thee with my eye. If you can believe, God can furnish what you have need of. That man sitting there with his hand up on his chin with that high blood pressure, you believe God would make you well, sir? You do? Sitting with your hand like this. You believe God will heal you the high blood pressure? Raise up your hand if you believe it. All right? He does it. I've never seen the man in my life. I know nothing about him. But you heard that Jesus said here in the Bible that he would do these things. Now, you see it. You see what I mean? If thou canst believe, all things are possible. Only to them that believe. It takes real genuine faith to do it. But if you can believe it, God will grant it. There's a lady sitting right back there looking at me. Got a garter in her throat. Lady sitting next by, sitting next to her, she'll understand. That lady there has high blood pressure also. That's right. Lady sitting next to her, she has a, a trouble too. And she's not from here. She's from Arkansas. They're missing it. Miss Phillips, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be healed. <laughs> you believe him? With all your heart, accept it? That's, and you can have it. Now, he says it's mysterious. No, no. Jesus said, your name is Simon. You're the son of Jonas. Is that right? I have heard of thee with my ear. Now I see thee with my eye. Now, don't you see what happened? Someone is sitting there looking, believing, trusting, and all at once there it happens. Feeling better, son, tonight than you did last night? Say it again. It's all right now. You're going to be well. <laughs> Sitting here last night, butting his head and everything else. Now tonight he looks like a gentleman. He's a little bit confused about things, but it's all straightened out now. It'll be all right. And in that day, the Son of Man is being revealed. See, just before Sodom is to be burned. I have heard of thee with my ear. Now I see thee with my eye. I heard Jesus Christ say he promised that. I see that promise living right now. I have heard of thee with my ear. Now I see him with my eye. How many believes that to be him? Oh God. Now, while we're here, it's getting late. Tomorrow night we're going to have a great healing service. We're expecting 
Brother Moore and I to stand here and pray for every person who wants to come through the line. But I thought in speaking this tonight, I was just going to make the altar call, but then I thought, no. It said there, I have heard of thee with the ear and eye, I want to see you with my eye. Now he's here. Do you believe that? Amen. Now, let's lay our hands over on one another. Now remember, the same one that promised he would do this said, these signs shall follow them that believe. Did he say it? Are you a believer? Say amen. amen. Well, then, the same God that made this promise that you've seen performed just now, asked any of those people. I've never seen them. Know nothing about them. I wouldn't know them right now. See? Impossible for me to do. But that scripture's got to be fulfilled. Well, if that's fulfilled, it shows we're in the latter times. We know the Son of Man is ready to be to come because He's revealing Himself in human flesh. Is that right? Then we know it's true. And you say you're a believer on Him. And you've got your hands laid on one another. If your hands are laid on one another, that same Son of God, which is here to make this come true to your eyes, the same Son is here to say they shall recover. The same Son of God. I heard that He said if the believers lay their hands on they shall recover. I heard it with my ears. Now let me see it with my eyes. He promised to do it. Now, while I pray, you pray. Lord Jesus, in the name of the Lord God of heaven, let your spirit drop into these people's heart that genuine faith of God that will confirm this promise to them. And may the God of heaven heal every one of them as they obey your commandments by laying hands on each other. Let it be so, Lord. In the name of Jesus Christ, grant that it will be so for your glory. Now, do you believe that you got what you asked for? Does something in your heart tell you do you feel that little speck of inspiration says, why, it's over. It's done. The commandment of God said that we could hear it with our ear. Now we can see it with our eye. Job said, I've heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now I see thee with my eyes. Now you heard it by the word, by the hearing of the word. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing word. Now you see it act with your eyes. Now, that same God that said that, when these things are to be taken place, that the believers on this would lay their hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Now, has it dropped into your heart that you're healed? Raise your hands if you do. Amen. That's real apostolic healing. You mean it? You believe it with all your heart? Hallelujah. That's all we need. Let's stand on our feet and give Him praise then. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I will praise Him. I will praise Him. Praise the Lamb for sinners. I give Him glory. I'll keep Him. For his blood has washed away he stands. Now, do you love him? Now let's all together give him glory, all ye people. Now look, if that has been revealed to you by God in the channel that you were saved in, the same channel that told you you were saved. The same channel God moved through like He did through Job and the prophets. He's moved to you through that channel as a Christian by His divine revelation that you are healed. Then there's nothing going to keep it from happening. So we give Him glory all ye people for His blood has washed away ever doubt washed away ever doubt I will praise Him I will praise Him praise the Lamb of sinners again him 
Don't you love him? Oh, how wonderful. I have heard of thee, Lord, with my ear, and faith cometh by hearing. But now I see thee, God, making himself known among his people like he did to Abraham by his promise here that the Son of Man would reveal himself in the days that the world become in a Sodom condition. And there was three messengers went forth, come down from heaven. And there was a denominational group down in Sodom. And a Billy Graham and an Oral Roberts went down there. And remember, as I've told you, nowhere in the history of the church has there ever been a messenger sent universal to the church until now with his name ending like Abraham, H-A-M, G-R-A-H-A-M, six letters to the world. Man's number. But Abraham had seven letters in the name. God's complete and perfect number. See? And notice what the messengers did that went out in there. Preached the word. Called them out. Told them to repent. But the one who stayed back with Abraham, see, performed a miracle. By telling Abraham what Sarah was doing and thinking in the tent behind him. And Jesus, who was the one that was in this person, said, when the world gets in a Sodom condition like it was then, the Son of Man will be revealed again. And with all the other scriptures confirming that to be so, the, in the beginning was the, and the Word was with, and the Word was, and the Word was made flesh, and dwelt among us. Is that right? Now, we see that same promised word of Luke, of Malachi, all these other promises from the day, made flesh dwelling among us that we heard with our ears. Now we see him with our eyes interpreting his own word. We don't need any interpretation of man. Oh, church of the living God, hear it on the phones. Wake up quick before it's too late. God bless you. I love him. I love him. think, church, that you're looking with your own eyes, the living Word of God made manifest, the promise of the hour in the last days, looking with your own eyes at the living Word being interpreted in natural form, God among us, I see Him with my own eyes. The one I heard that he would do it. All the old sages look for this day. Now we see it manifested with our own eyes. How many of the old shouting Methodists, Baptists, and the real genuine Pentecostals in their age long to see this happen? Many of them know it would happen. But we stand tonight seeing it happen. Oh, don't you love him? Now Jesus said, this will all men know you're my disciples when you love one another. So as we love him, let's shake one another's hands and say, uh, I will praise him, I will praise him. All right. I will praise him. What 
did the queen of Belteshazzar say before her king that night? There is a man in your kingdom that is a dissolver of doubts. And the Holy Ghost tonight is the dissolver of doubts. Do you believe that? What she want? Uh, the dissolver of doubts. Now, the blood of Christ takes away each stain, the stain of doubt. There's not a greater sin in the world than unbelief. For he that believeth not is condemned already. Is that right? He that believeth not is condemned. There's only one sin. That's unbelief. Smoking's not a sin. Cursing's not a sin. Committing adultery's not a sin. Lying is not a sin. That isn't sin. That's the results of unbelief. Unbelief, you do it because you don't believe. If you do believe it, you don't do it. Oh, what? Wonderful. And the blood of the Lamb has washed away every doubt. We believe His Word emphatically. We believe that the Word was made flesh. And we believe the Word is made flesh by the vindication of His presence now to confirm His Word. Do you believe it? Amen. God bless you. We hope to see you here in the morning for a great time in the Lord. Bow your heads now. I'll give the service to Brother Lindsay.